Hello and welcome to the Fat Boss Guide to the Fallen Avatar on Mythic in the Tomb of Sargeras. So this is the first encounter in the instance where it is likely that you'll need multiple hundreds of pulls to get it down. It just really isn't an easy fight by any means. The boss has a huge amount of health and even after a nerf that came in a around a month ago or so, the enrage on the fight is still pretty tight. We've held off actually making this video as we expected more nerfs to hit the encounter, but it doesn't appear that they'll be coming anytime soon. And if any significant changes do hit the boss, we'll keep you guys updated in the comments anyway. There is a lot to go over, let's start off and talk about composition. So you will need a speed taunt for the last phase to reduce the seer stacks the boss gains. Warrior tanks are a better option than monks as they do provide decent leech for the raid, but if that is not an option, monks will just have to do instead. Do note that Mistweavers and Windwalkers can also speed taunt if you don't have a monk tank available. On Mythic, there are five touch Sargeras circles rather than three. All players are busy during phase one, so to alleviate the pressure, ideally you want to solo every single one using an immunity or damage reduction. Phase one will last for a little over five minutes and the circles come in every 60 seconds or so, so in total you'll have 25 circles to soak over five minutes. Having immunities for every single one isn't really possible, so you'll need to make sure you can work in big damage reductions as well. This is where rogues come in. Rogues can soak them just by using Faint. They'll drop to extremely low health, but they won't die from it. Using both Vile and Faint makes it even safer. So if you can bring five rogues, that is the perfect comp. They are just great for dealing with these Touch of Sargeras circles, and they're also super useful for the last phase of the Dark Marks, which we'll obviously talk about later. On another note, rogues are also super useful for kill Jaden, so if you don't have four or five of them, it might be worth looking to invest getting more for both Avatar and kill Jaden. The likelihood, however, of you having five rogues is naturally going to be very low, and really, if it isn't possible, just go with as many rogues as you can. The boss has been killed with only two rogues before. However, you will need to set up a rotation of players to soak each circle individually, every player using at least a 50% damage reduction or an immunity, which sucks as the damage reductions are super useful used elsewhere in the encounter. If that's not possible, instead you'll have to assign small groups of two to three players to soak circles instead, which really isn't ideal, but if that's what you gotta do, you just have to do it. Just keep in mind that five circles spawn every 60 seconds and you'll need to do it five times over the duration of phase one. The circles take eight seconds to explode and will spawn typically spread out around the room. Having preset locations for people to soak will eliminate a missed soak. So you'll need to make clear assignments for each player for each individual waves of Sargera circles. When making the assignments, you do however need to keep in mind which players are dealing with the new mechanic and at which point. On Mythic, you'll still have to put the Maiden in the beam to prevent the boss from gaining energy. However, there are two additional beams that spawn at the exact same time. These purple beams work in the exact same way, they simply just fire towards the boss and give him energy. However, of course, the Maiden can't be in three places at once, and even if you could do that, when the Maiden is within the purple beams, she deals lethal ticking damage to the entire raid, so players are forced to soak them instead. Whilst inside the beam you take small ticking damage, but you also receive a debuff that reduces the healing that you receive by 10%, and this stacks. And at 10 stacks, you just instantly die. And to add when you do die, your stacks don't even reset. So you need to wait for the debuff to drop, which takes an entire 60 seconds before you can even be rezzed. So you've got to rotate players within the beam to prevent people from hitting 10 stacks. We set up two groups. Each group has six players consisting of healers and range DPS. One group is assigned to deal with the left hand side beam and the other group deals with the right. Within that group, we have a set order that we rotate players on, each player moving into the beam once the previous player has six stacks. If a player stays in the beam for much longer than six stacks, by the time they have to soak again, their stacks may not have dropped. To add, it's absolutely horrible for healers to try and keep a player alive if they have seven, eight, or even nine stacks, as they're taking so little healing, and we'll touch on healing in just a minute. If a player does go beyond six stacks, or perhaps refreshes their debuff and cannot soak, we actually assign rogues and other melee as backups, but this isn't always possible as they could be dealing with other things such as Sargera circles. More often than not, if you mess up the stacks, it's really hard to come back from it and it's pretty much a wipe and you just have to go again. Each time a player is soaking within a beam, we actually have them call the next player to come and soak in advance. This is a really good way to prevent any issues with players coming in too late and someone getting really high stacks, or that player not coming at all and that person simply getting 10 stacks and dying. 
Now typically while you're soaking inside the beam you'll want to be as close to the spawn location as possible. This allows players to freely move around the room in front of you. If a player accidentally passes through a beam, even for a split second, they'll instantly get a stack, refreshing any stacks they already had, and the soaking player will gain an additional stack almost immediately. By standing right at the back you just simply prevent these issues from ever happening, and you'll also be reducing the damage you'll be taking from the rupturing singularity, which does go off while you're soaking. But to add, you also give yourself a clear runway when Unbound Chaos is cast. If you leave the beam even for a second, the boss will gain energy immediately, so you have to stay within the beam at all times, even when Unbound Chaos is cast. Now the Unbound Chaos will actually come in at two different timings while you're within the beam. One of those times will be while you have low stacks and you don't need to rotate with a player anytime soon. At this point, absolutely everyone needs to keep away from your line. If anyone passes through in front of you while you're moving down your line, you're simply going to get hit by their circles and you're going to die. You're forced to stay in your beam and you have nowhere else to go to. So if some arsehole does move in front of your path, you are screwed and it's their fault. You need to make sure this situation never happens. And the second situation is as you're rotating players, and this can happen mid unbound chaos. This situation basically just needs good pre-planning, you need to make sure that you either move further down the line so the new player has room to move into where the beam starts, or the next player can simply just move in early. If that player does decide to use that strategy instead, they need to make sure their stacks have dropped first. So as long as the two players are vocal between each other and they can make a plan before the unbound chaos even comes in, this situation really isn't as bad as it seems. Now to make the Unbound Chaos even cleaner just in general, we have loose set positions for players to be stood in and everyone runs directly backwards when it actually goes off. If you have free for all positions and you don't allow your healers to be stood close to the boss, you're definitely going to have random deaths left, right and center while you're progressing this boss. So to help that, we assign three players per pizza slice of the room, allowing healers to be stood much closer to the boss than range DPS, and then melee sort of take the inner circle. This typically works absolutely perfect for when Unbound Chaos comes in. Now let's talk about healing, because healing this phase can be very rough. There are moments where players will be soaking, and then shortly after they leave their beam, rupturing singularity will come, or a chaos will come, or they'll be hit by the blades. It is vital that players in beams are kept topped up, and it's also important to keep players that have six stacks topped up permanently. As you're spread, this can be difficult, and it makes certain healing classes much better than others. Druids are particularly strong. On our first kills, we actually use three druids and one paladin. Having multiple druids just allows you to constantly blanket all players soaking with hots, and as they have stacks that are reducing healing, it very rarely overheals, so you become incredibly effective and efficient. Since then, we have actually re-killed the boss of only a single druid, but the healing difference is definitely noticeable. The main healer that really struggles in this particular phase is Holy Priest. If you can go disc instead for this fight, we would really recommend it. But ultimately, with a Holy Priest, you still can kill the boss. It's just pretty rough. Other healers do work fine. This boss has been killed with almost any composition. Just keep in mind that the last phase is also tough on healers. So you need to be as mana efficient in phase one as possible. So you have everything to go crazy with in the last phase. In terms of healing cooldowns, we use them for the first four rupturing singularities and then save everything after that point for the last phase. Let's talk about the blades next. On Mythic, you'll have five of these instead of three. You'll have three that spawn in melee, and one in the back left corner, and one in the back right. You want to deal with these blades just like you did on Heroic. The best place to the sides or at the back of the room. Just reacting to them quickly is pretty much the only thing you can do. If you're not able to put them in a decent location, say that your mobility is on CD for whatever reason, then you're forced to instead put them somewhere in the middle of the room. Just make sure that you do not place them on the beam lines. If somebody is soaking their beam and then Unbound Chaos comes in and they have a blade pull in their line, they're absolutely screwed without a movement speed increase or a blessing of freedom. Just keep away from other people's lines and try and minimize the chance that other players are hit. Do note that the blades will not target players that are currently soaking beams, however they will target players that are just about to go into a beam. If you are unfortunate enough to have this situation, you still need to make sure that you take over soaking from the other player, otherwise his stacks are going to go too high and it's going to just go out of control. So just take the hit whilst you're in the beam and make sure that the healers top you up. And the last thing to touch on in this phase is the Maiden. So she has a lot of health and therefore so does her shield. Every time it's up, you have 20 seconds to deal 190 million damage to her. 
For the first shield, it's pretty easy to do because there's no other mechanics going on, so you simply just nuke her down. However, for the second shield and the third shield, you don't always have the exact same abilities every single attempt, as the boss has a spell queuing issue that makes each attempt slightly different. But regardless, you will always have some mechanic that you need to deal with at the exact same time, whether that's daggers, or rupturing singularity, or unbound chaos, or a mixture of all of them. Regardless, these are the worst shields, especially the third one. It's vital that all your DPS is ready to swap to these shields, just to break them as soon as possible. And if you are struggling, it might even be worth a couple of players holding off with their CDs and saving them just for them. We can't give you much more advice than that, you'll just have to work that one out yourself. As for the fourth shield, we actually completely ignore it, let the boss reach 100% energy, consume her, and then we transition into phase two. However, of course, the consume mechanic does heal the boss for a large amount, depending on how much health the maiden has, so it's vital that you get the maiden as low as possible before this point even hits. To pull this off well, you just want all classes that can multi-dot or cleave to constantly be hitting her. You never want single target DPS on her, because ultimately you need to be doing as much damage to the boss as possible. As soon as the fourth shield hits, you want the maiden to be a 1% or even lower. You want everyone to absolutely ignore the shield, you nuke the living shit out of the boss, and just before her cast finishes, you'll want everyone to leave the beams, make sure the boss gets hit, he'll get 100% energy, consume her, and then you'll transition into phase two. And that's all you need to know for that. But to cover this phase very quickly, before we move on and talk about phase two, you need to set up exactly who is soaking what sets of Sargera circles. You want to set up two groups of six players, ideally ranged DPS and healers to constantly rotate in the left and right purple beams on six stacks. Tanks, you need to do exactly what you did on Heroic, taunt on two and swap jobs on the Maiden. When Unbound Chaos is cast, you need to keep away from players that are within inside the beams. Daggers need to be placed towards the back and the edges of the room. And again, keep away from players that are in beams. You want to move as far away from the boss as possible when Ruptures is cast and use healing cooldowns for the first four. And you want to get the Maiden as low as possible before the fourth shield comes in, nuke the boss during the time the shield is up, and then move out the beams and let the boss transition before the Maiden's cast finishes. And that's all you need to know. But also, you need to make sure that the boss is at least 32% health or lower, because any higher than that, you're going to struggle and not make the damage requirement in the last phase. That sounds pretty easy, really. Yeah. yeah, no problems. That's like a couple pulls. Either way, as you are falling down into phase two, you actually want to use avalanche elixirs. It'll make you immune to all fall damage, and it doesn't share a cooldown with any other pots, so why not? Just make sure you stock up on avalanche elixirs before you jump into the raid. Now from the start, you want to spread your ranged and healers into the four corners of the room to deal with the new mechanic in this phase. Reign of the Destroyer circles will appear around the platform on a timer throughout the phase. They spawn in a staggered fashion and meteors land in those locations six seconds later. If a player is not within the circle when it lands, it will destroy that area of the platform but it will also do a huge amount of damage to the raid. It pretty much wipes you if you don't soak the circles. The first set is the hardest to deal with as there are so many areas where they'll land, but as the platform is destroyed by rupture realities, it becomes much easier to deal with them. Without damage reduction, soakers will be hit for around 50% of their health. Just make sure that they are topped up beforehand and they'll be safe. Do note, however, that occasionally while you are soaking these circles, tornadoes will come across the platform. If you're unlucky, they'll pass through the area you're soaking in. Typically, you can move from them and then just move back into the circle. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes they'll pass through the exact same time as the meteor lands. So you're just forced to stand in it and then just be healed afterwards. You can use a damage reduction or an immunity if you have to, but ideally they're best saved for the dark marks. After the first set of rains is soaked, we move the boss to the top left corner of the platform. It is vital that the boss is positioned one square away from the corner, as you'll want the boss to destroy a large amount of platform to make later rain soaks even easier. As it is being moved, the first set of dark marks come in. We use boss mods to give each player a number. Mark 1, which lasts 6 seconds, is assigned to stand on the left foot in melee. Mark 2, which lasts 8 seconds, is assigned to stand on the right foot in melee. Now both of these melee marks are soaked by the melee team as well as the off tank. This once again is another reason why you want to bring as many rogues as possible, as by them using faint they can easily help soak and not take a lot of damage themselves, as well as being able to shadow step back to the boss and even help soak two marks at the same time if they want to. Either way, this is something that you're going to need to organize yourself. If you don't have enough melee DPS, then you're going to even need to send in range DPS to help soak as well. Mark 3, which lasts 10 seconds, is the one that we solo, and if you can't solo it, we have the range DPS come and help instead. 
Note that any class can solo a Dark Mark as long as they receive a 60% or higher damage reduction. And to help this, it is a really good idea to use Healer External cooldowns just to make sure that these players can solo their marks. After the last mark explodes, you'll get your very first Ruptures cast. Everyone then needs to run to a set safe spot that is positioned one square out in the opposite corner of the room. We use a gateway to help any melee players without a movement speed increase get back to this safe spot. By standing right at the top of this square, you're actually completely safe from any winds that are passing through the room and you remain within DPS range of the boss. We don't use any healing cooldowns at this point, we just make sure that everybody is topped up before the Ruptures cast goes off. After the Ruptures has gone off, it is vital that you use a Speed Taunt to get the boss out of the lava as soon as possible. You should only ever get two Seer stacks per Ruptures cast. Any more than two, and your healers are really going to struggle. Shortly afterwards, you'll have your next Reign of the Destroyer. The four previous groups that you had set out will now merge into two, one covering the right side and one covering the left. As the meteors land, you'll then have your second marks. We deal with these in the exact same way as the first, except the person that gets the third mark either has to solo it or they're just going to kill themselves. It is really not worth having ranged players try and help them because they're more likely to die themselves. After the marks are over, the bosses move down to the left hand side of the platform and position between the last two squares. This is to allow the range DPS to stand on this marker as shown on screen here. This is a safe spot from winds and it allows you to continue doing damage to the boss during this rupture realities. We use a single output healing cooldown for this rupture such as a trank. You'll then have rain soaks and dark marks at the exact same time, as well as a minimum of 4 seer stacks destroying the raid. For this set of marks, the first person is soaked in melee, and then mark 2 and mark 3 are soloed or sacrificed. We use another healing cooldown at this point just to make soaking the rain safer, as well as trying to top up anyone that also helped soak the first player. We then move back to the safe spot as the boss is moved into the top right corner. As the rupturing is cast, you'll then have another set of marks. These ones are all sacrificed or all soloed. Before the rupture cast is finished, we use another healing cooldown just to make sure the raid is topped, and we use another immediately afterwards to cover the rupture damage. And from this point onwards, you just gotta kinda use whatever healing and survival stuff you have left. You now have one final square to kill the boss in, and all marks at this point are immune or they're sacrificed because if you stand in the raid with them, you're just gonna kill everyone. And you just need to kill the boss at this point before the next Ruptures cast goes off, because when it does, you're all pretty much going to get one shot. And that's it for Phase 2, but before we do conclude this guide, it is worth mentioning that Phase 1 is likely to take far longer for you to progress than Phase 2, just in terms of pool numbers. With that in mind, and the fact that you can transition the boss into Phase 2 whenever you want, it's actually a good idea to progress Phase 2 first. That way, when you get the hang of phase 1 and you get a decent pulls off into phase 2, you don't just wipe immediately because you have no experience. So start your progression in phase 2 first, just make sure you get the hang of that phase, just don't worry about doing damage, it's not accurate as the boss won't be in execute. Just get used to soaking the reins, uh, soaking and immuning the marks, moving the boss for ruptures, and getting healing cooldowns right. Once you're happy with your phase 2 and you're confident that if you get there with the boss around 30% you can kill it, then you really want to start your phase 1 progression. And honestly, that's more or less everything that you need to know about this boss. Well, thank you very much for watching, guys. If this guide helped you out at all, then do drop us down a like. If you'd like to know more about this encounter or any of the other fights in the Tomb of Sargeras, you can check out our written guides out over on Wowhead. A link for that is in the description. And before we do go, we'd like to give a huge thank you to all of our supporters over on Patreon. You guys are absolutely awesome. We appreciate everything you do for us. And we shall see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.